Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, welcome to the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Uh, I'm Cliff May. I'm FDD's founder and president. And I'm pleased to welcome you today to our conversation, Securing the Courts, Exploitation of the Judicial System by Foreign Adversaries. Um, I want to particularly welcome Judge Royce Lambert, who's with us today. He is a 2016 a winner of FDD's Alberto Nisman Award. So we're particularly pleased to see you looking, looking so well. We're pleased uh, today to host, thank you, yes, give a hand to just a uh, shout out to you. Thank you, <laughs> great admirers. We're pleased to host today's program as part of FDD's Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation, which seeks to advance U.S. prosperity and security through technology innovation while countering cyber threats that seek to diminish it. Today's modern economy is deeply threatened by the ongoing massive theft of core American private sector intellectual property by foreign adversaries, most notably People's Republic of China. An important but significantly underreported aspect of this threat is the leakage of national security related technologies to foreign actors through our bankruptcy courts. Adversaries are exploiting the U.S. legal system to turn risks to economic security into critical national security threats. This is an important topic that FDD's transformative cyber innovation lab has been tackling. And we are proud to bring together today's panel to dive deeper into this issue with our co-sponsors, Morgan Lewis and the National Security Institute at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School. Thank you for your partnership. Um, Samantha Ravitch, CCTI chairman, will moderate today's conversation. Samantha also serves as the vice chair of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board, also as a member of the congressionally mandated Cyberspace Solarium Commission, and she also serves on the Secretary of Energy's Advisory Board. By way of housekeeping, I should note that today's event will be live streamed, is being live streamed. I encourage guests both here and online to join in on today's events. Uh, you can talk about it, comment on it on Twitter, which is just at FDD. Um, I'd also ask that you silence your cell phones at this time. And with that, Samantha, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Cliff. And, and uh, thank you all for, for coming out. So about a year and a half ago, um, FDD, uh, w with Cliff and, and Mark Dubowitz, we launched the Transformative Cyber Innovation Lab to kind of tackle the hardest whole of society cyber issues. And in a conversation with uh, Dr. Michael Shea, who is the executive director of the lab, um, formerly of, of DARPA, um, it came out that there is serious technology leakage happening out of our bankruptcy courts. We didn't really know how big a problem with this was. We didn't know whether anybody was tracking it. Um, but we, we felt that there was a there there, and a very critical there there. Um, so uh, we brought in Camille Stewart uh, to kind of dig into this more deeply, to understand the scope <coughs> and the scale of the problem, um, what laws, existing laws and regulations, might be able to close these loopholes, what else might need to be done. Um, and she wrote a phenomenal paper. Uh, there are copies outside. I hope you all have seen it. Um, Full Court Press, Preventing Foreign Adversaries from Exfiltrating National Security Technologies Through Bankruptcy Proceedings. Um, identifying the problem is clearly the first step. First, recognize you have a problem, right? Um, but at TESOL, at, at our lab, we don't just identify problems. Um, we look for legal, regulatory, and technological solutions to these problems, many of which we're going to address today. So um, let me introduce very quickly uh, the panel, and then we'll get really right to the heart of, uh, heart of the matter. Um, uh, Giovanna Cinelli is a partner at Morgan Lewis, working with clients in the defense and high tech sectors on a broad range of issues affecting national security, including CFIUS and export enforcement. She is a true force of nature, <laughs> and uh, we, are, we are really fortunate um, that she has joined with us on this effort. Um, Jamil Jaffer is the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute at George Mason. Um, as, as Cliff just said, he previously, uh, Jamil has previously served in a variety of government roles, including as the chief counsel and senior advisor for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. 
Um, Harvey Rishikoff is senior counselor of the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Law and National Security and advisor to the Harvard Law <laughs> Journal on National Security. If you don't know Harvey or know of his work, you really kind of don't know anything. Because <laughs> you really have to. Um, and our very, very own um, uh, Camille Stewart is an attorney working at the intersection of technology, cyber, and national security and foreign policy issues. Um, Camille is also a member of FDD's National Security Alumni Network, uh, which is how we were originally introduced. And I know we have a few other alumni in the room, and I would encourage other mid-career professionals um, who haven't yet participated in the program uh, to pick up a pamphlet and uh, <laughs> check out uh, upcoming opportunities. So um, first, we're going to start with the scale of the problem. Then we'll move to discussion of uh, potential solutions. And then we're going to open it up to, to Q&A to focus on uh, what you all want to focus on. So let me, let me start with Camille. So in your, in your paper, you identified a number of uh, cases where companies backed by nation state actors um, acquired sensitive technology. Uh, talk us through how this happens, how you've seen this happen. Um, share a couple of maybe the stories that, that you discovered during your, your writing of the paper and research. Yeah, so um, thank you all for coming out today. Looking forward to this discussion. Imagine you are an innovator who comes up with a brand new microchip. It's faster, smaller, more powerful than anything that's on the market. And as you conceive of it, it'll go into a cell phone. You start to build the capability and try to get it out into the market, but you run out of funds. And so to recoup on that investment, you turn to bankruptcy to try to get some of your money back, to sell off the capability, hope somebody will take it further, and to start your next venture. You just want to get out from under the debt, and so you are willing to sell to the first person that comes along. Um, the technology you created, although conceived of for cell phones, is such a powerful chip that it could go into weaponry, et cetera. And you, you kind of know that, but that's not the market that you're in at the current moment. This is actually something that happened um, in the ATOP tech case. They sold their capability to um, Avatar Systems, which was a Chinese-backed company. Um, actually, one of their competitors and a creditor, Synopsys, tried to raise a red flag and say, there are some problems here. Maybe this should go through CFIUS review. That was shut down. Avatar filed a protective order that quashed their ability to uh, raise issues in the case. And ATOP was sold off to Avatar. Can you imagine that capability unchecked and moving in the market and into the hands of foreign adversaries? That chip implanted in uh, SCADA systems, ICS systems, weaponry, your cell phone, um, having a nexus to a foreign actor that we are not tracking, right? You're, that's a huge supply chain implication that could lead to a potential cyber attack. Um, another good example is Molly Corp, the, the sole <laughs> rare earth mineral mine in the United States. That is really important because rare earth minerals are essential to military and technology capabilities. Um, this uh, mine was, in 2015, going through a bit of trouble and almost went up for bankruptcy, and DOD stepped in to support it. But in 2017, went up for bankruptcy again and was sold off to Shanghai Resources. So the mining rights for the sole rare earth mineral mine in the United States was then sold off. So we purchase all our rare earth minerals from other countries, and the predominance of that from China, particularly in the, uh, the advent of this sale, which is coming up again now as the Pentagon asks for funds to mitigate this threat. N access to rare earth mineral mines is essential and has become a bartering chip in the U.S.-China trade negotiations. So this kind of illustrates how bankruptcy, a hallmark in our innovation ecosystem, has become an avenue not only for uh, foreign adversaries to acquire these capabilities by being party to a sale, but also just the observation of it in an open courtroom. Mm -hmm. We've also seen cases where whether uh, because the folks party to the, to the proceeding have not requested a protective order or requested an in-camera review, sensitive schematics or other information are displayed in open court, 
put into filings, et cetera, and folks can observe an open court, pull the filings, be a creditor in a creditor's roundtable, et cetera, um, and get access to a bunch of really sensitive technology. Yeah, th that's great. Following up on, on that point, Giovanna, and first of all, thank you and, and your firm for co-sponsoring this event. Um, I, but you had mentioned when we were talking before that there's a similar case that's starting as percolated even as, as late as last week. So if you could mention that and then also picking up on what Camille said about how, how is this information on technology actually displayed in open court? Because I don't think a lot of people understand exactly how vulnerable we truly are in this regard. Let me also second, uh, I'm so grateful to be here. <clears throat> I appreciate this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I've practiced for 34 years, and I was also a judicial clerk, and so saw it from that perspective as well as through the practice. Uh, so the case that you're talking about is the Dr. Peng and N-Touch case. And it was interesting there because in a couple of years ago, Dr. Peng came in and bought N-Touch, which is a telecommunications firm, and at the time that that happened, um, that would have been subject to CFIUS review, although there was not a mandatory filing, but it was also required uh, that FCC licenses needed to be filed because there was a change in ownership. Neither of those circumstances happened. Over the course of the last few years, <clears throat> um, Dr. Pengs has been put into financial distress. There's been changes in China with respect to outward bound investments. So they are now in bankruptcy and going through the bankruptcy process. And their assets are up. And there is discussion about transferring the asset to another Chinese company. But of equal importance, Dr. Peng has been involved in the establishment of the Hong Kong to US cable that Google and Facebook and others have been funding them to build, and questions exist about what type of technology did they obtain, not only through N-Touch, what will happen if a second Chinese party comes in through a bankruptcy proceeding. And separately, there may be bankruptcy proceedings in China <coughs> that could expose information wow. through that proceeding. So that's a case that's currently winding its way through the system. I did want to mention, because Molly Corp is an interesting example, many of you probably remember uh, in 1995, Molly Corp was sold. Again, the mine was unable to sustain itself. There was a critical need from Defense Department perspective, but there just wasn't enough volume. And given some of our other laws, such as environmental requirements, it was very costly to maintain the mine given that output. And frankly, in that time period, we were looking at the inception of the age of information. While there were some cell phones, lots of things were still fax machines and hard lines, most of the product was used in defense-oriented mm -hmm. systems, guidance systems for missiles and uh, submarines and things like that. <clears throat> but, but there was work being done. Nonetheless, the uh, mine was sold. And that capability went away. And there was a belief at that time that DOD had sufficient uh, stockpiled capability. Now that's an interesting technical question about the longevity of a product. Does it deteriorate over time? And that can chemically affect uh, minerals and, and other substances which have lives in certain circumstances. So even if you're stockpiling, when you allow something to be sold either in a bankruptcy proceeding or other item, you're going to have a back-end problem given how long you think what you have stockpiled will survive. But coming back to the court system, <clears throat> we have a premise in our court systems that everything is open. It's very difficult to close a courtroom, not just a bankruptcy courtroom, but others, because there's a presumption that our system of justice should be available to all so that they can understand the issues, the interpretations, the parties that are involved, and candidly as a check on the accountability and consistency and accuracy of what happens in the proceedings. It is foundationally one of the preeminent elements of our system, and it's what makes the United States an attractive um, jurisdiction to come and develop technologies and products, because the back end of challenges and violations of your rights uh, have an objective system of protection. And even within that system, the courts have, for long periods of time, understood the sensitivity of some information being publicly shared, which is why, as Camille mentioned, there are protective orders and there is in-camera review. 
But traditionally, that has not focused on export controlled information. It's been primarily a focus on proprietary information. The challenge is that, like concentric circles, proprietary information and export controlled information overlap in a large number of areas. So take, for example, um, a patent. So in a bankruptcy proceeding, you may have a patent that is in the asset base. And the patent is publicly available. Anyone, even from Cuba or Iran, could access it because it is publicly available information. But the patent by itself, even though it discusses best mode and also enablement technologies, does not present the know-how or other trade secreted information that is also part of the asset base. And when someone buys these assets out of bankruptcy, they get not only the patent, but they get all the underlying information that is not reflected directly in the patent. And that information can be export controlled under one of 28 different regimes in the United States, although the primary ones are the Department of Commerce and the Department of State. Protective orders that exist in criminal, civil, and bankruptcy rules uh, would perhaps uh, be addressed yeah. in, by adding the word export controls uh, as another area besides proprietary information that could be covered more routinely. And there have been a number of cases starting from 1988 with the seminal case of Melvin versus United States, which was a patent on the F-16. And the judge said this requires a protective order and all information was put under the order. Uh, and, uh, and there's been others. The Ross Himes case, the Iridium bankruptcy case is another one where there have been extensive protective orders with respect to export control technology. Yeah, no, that's it's so, as, as you can tell just from uh, Giovanna just dipping her toe into this, um, uh, this is not just onesies and twosies. This is a, a whole scale uh, problem. And, and, and Jamil, when we when we think about you know who's on the um, uh, uh, the other side of the equation going after that, I mean we've written a lot here um, uh, on cyber enabled economic warfare, but you, uh, you and the National Security Institute, which I also need to thank because they've been a wonderful co-sponsor in in this regard. But but you and your colleagues have really written about Beijing's strategy for technological acquisition. So perhaps we can take a step back. What yeah. is this all in service of? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, there's obviously two key aspects to this effort uh, that the Chinese are engaged in. One is the obvious national security aspect, uh, the desire to have technologies and capabilities uh, that, are, that meet and exceed our capabilities, uh, both in the short run and that they can build on in the long run. But the real, the newer play, and the one that's actually much more interesting, and the one that the president's talked a lot about, the one uh, that I know John Demers, the Assistant Attorney General for National Security, who's here with us today, my former boss, um, has been looking at extensively, <laughs> is the economic move, right? Which is to say, uh, the taking, this, the theft of American technology, right? Whether it's through cyber-enabled means, through the bankruptcy courts, uh, through extorting American companies uh, for access to the Chinese market, um, that's an economic move. Right? It's an effort to, to take our billion, the billions of dollars that American companies invest in R&D every day, every year, um, and repurpose it in China for their economic advantage. Um, it's a step change in behavior that we haven't seen in the globe um, until the most recent era. We've known about this now for the better part of a decade. The US government's only been talking about it a little more recently. Uh, my now current for, uh, boss, uh, former director of NSA, Keith Alexander, has talked about it as the greatest uh, transfer of wealth in human history. Um, and I think that's right. Um, and I, it's an ongoing thing. And so it's, it's not just, we've always talked about it in the cyber context, right? They're stealing our IP. That's been a common theme of government discussion in the last five to eight years. Um, but this new sort of era of action, the bankruptcy courts, uh, the extortion of American companies in China to get access to the market, um, this is another methodology the Chinese are using not just to have access to national security technology or to have access to telecommunications technology so they can control their own citizenry, but Primarily, so they can take that technology, give it to other, give it to their own companies, give those companies low interest or no interest loans, right? Gov mm -hmm, essentially, mm -hmm. state-owned enterprises, what we call state-owned enterprises in any other context, Huawei and ZT to name to name two obvious examples, um, that then become national champions, and now are becoming for the Chinese global champions. I mean, Huawei is dominating the 5G market, not because they necessarily have better technology. The British have told us their technology is actually pretty pretty awful. Um, there are debates about it. There are debates about how much they stole and how much they built on um, and how good it is. 
Um, but what is unquestionable is that their dominance is driven in part mm -hmm. because of their ability to cut prices dramatically. And that's a feature of them getting low interest and no interest loans from the Chinese government. And so, and building this on the basis of not having to invest in R&D the way we had to. Um, and so, uh, lest you think this is just a threat also to big American companies mm -hmm. and, and the large industrial sector, it's not. Right? If you think about the modern American economy today, right, we're building our economy on the backs of modern, small technology companies that are developing very innovative, innovative capabilities um, that are then being bought or invested in by large companies, and then that's being taken to market. Those companies depend almost completely on protecting their intellectual property. And if it's walking out the back door, either through IP theft, or through extortion, or through the bankruptcy courts, well, that undermines the entire sort of validity of our new economic transformation. And so while there are a lot talking about the concerns about our move away from manufacturing and our, and our pivot to technology, right? if that capability itself is undermined, that's not just an economic threat, that's a strategic threat for our nation. And so that's one that I think it's really important that the, the current administration has recognized mm -hmm. that economic security is national security. Um, and it's important that the Justice Department is looking at that, that our courts are looking at it, and we need to be more cautious in the bankruptcy system and writ large about the threat. It's not just China, but China is the biggest player in the space right now. Yeah. Um, Harvey, through your work at ABA and, and, and MITRE, um, uh, you know, you see this problem from a lot of different angles and where it intersects the greater issue of the national security industrial base, the defense supply chain. I mean, how, how does this all fit into, sure. into that? So first, let me thank you guys for doing this at FTD and for you and your group and the paper. Um, this is a, a, a something that we, you, Jamal said, we just recently, we have the former director of the National Counterintelligence Executive sitting there. <laughs> Many of us have been talking about this issue for quite a long time. But many things in Washington are, it's very much like uh, tomatoes. Some thing, issues are ripe and some are less ripe. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. This is becoming a very ripe issue. And a lot of people are beginning to focus. And uh, the tools are, our adversaries have a variety of tools in order to gather critical information. And if you think about capitalism, the core to capitalism is innovation. That's what is at the leading front. We used to do studies about who's filing patents, who's doing IP, that's the leading edge. How many patent lawyers are in the room? How many IP lawyers are in the room? How many bankruptcy lawyers are in the room? OK, so there's one woman in the back. So usually bankers lawyers are not the most popular people in the firm. <laughs> uh, I have, early in my career, I did some bankruptcy litigation. The senior partners came up to me and said, you don't really want to spend a lot of time in this area, Harvey. You know, bankruptcy is sort of where debtors and creditors are. <laughs> you know, people have gone bankrupt. You know, the firm has to think about what's going forward. It's sort of like being spending too much time in a house of ill repute. Uh, <laughs> people think you're using the services if you stay too long. You have to or move at from, all. Oh, yeah. you, have, you have to move. Well, Thank I leave you. it to you for that. So that's sort of the concept that we had. We used to call bankruptcy member judges referees. They weren't Article One. So the point I'm making is that there's a variety of instrumentalities that adversaries have begun to understand that are very, very helpful. Don't just focus on the Chinese. I had a number of Russians approach me, clients, who were arguing that the Russians were using our bankruptcy courts to the, go after enemies of Putin, declaring bankruptcy issues, bringing their judgments to the United States bankruptcy courts, using the courts to be able to illuminate where all the assets were of the enemy of the Russian state in order then to try to seize those assets, which is the power that our courts have. So I start to call this now the F practice. <laughs> and when I say F practice, I'm thinking of lawyers usually we refer to as FARA, who do FARA law, who do FIRMA, or do CFIUS. These are all elements inside the structure that we have created in our legal framework that are starting to illuminate what the actual sources of finance are behind a variety of decisions that are being made by a group of adversaries who are focusing in on wanting to buy, gather, the concept 
of where the technology is to enhance their ability for them to compete internationally. It's awkward for us because, you know, we always believed in open sources. We've always believed in competition. And now we have entities that are not following our competition rules, but are being very effective. And the last I will say to you, uh, based on the paper that Camille did, I was at the American Banks Institute annual spring meeting in April. I don't know how many of you have made it, but it's a <laughs> gathering of the Jedi of the bankruptcy bar and bench. And, and I now have a whole bunch of pen pals from this group <laughs> who were fascinated by the understanding of what to do. And I have one concrete suggestion I'll sort of move end with is, and one of my bankruptcy new pen pals said, look, uh, we understand this is a problem. We were shocked by it. Our, the concrete solution is an amendment to the voluntary bankruptcy petition official form. The form keeps getting more and more complex. In the early 80s, is essentially this company hereby petitions for relief under Chapter X of the code. Now the debtor is obliged to disclose as part of the petition whether it has any hazardous waste that might pose an immediate uh, threat in public health and safety. Maybe another item might be added to the petition, whether the debtor has a business or assets that could be subject to CFIUS review in a cupboard. So there's a concrete way we can mm -hmm. use the court. And as you said, we're all about it, MITRE and the paper that we wrote in the front compromise. It's all about the illumination of the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And increasingly people are approaching me in the private sector saying, we want to do the right thing, but we want to know what the tools and assets are that will allow us to do this elimination. And I think um, there are a number of instruments we have in the law. As you know, we're talking amongst ourselves, a bunch of group, not to scare people, but you know, the War Production Act gives you incredible power for elimination. That ability for you to look and demand from, this, from the state to look at these contracts. And this is just part, this, this, this thing we're seeing of the bankruptcy, I want to put it in the context there is an array, array, an array of laws that lawyers usually stay in their silo, and they do not understand how our adversaries are using the instruments, and this, these forums help us be able to articulate them. Yeah, that is fantastic, and a perfect segue to the second part of this panel, where we're going to talk about solutions, um, uh, possible solutions, pathways to solutions, because here at the Transformative Cyber Innovation Lab, we don't only study the problem, um, but we uh, uh, create, we find to socialize solutions and pathways to them. So let me let me uh, kick it over to, to Giovanna. First of all, um, do the courts understand uh, that this is a problem on the first head? And and if so, or if not, what what tools are they bringing to bear in the situation? So I think like any area, there's inconsistent understanding. In some courts, there's quite a sophisticated understanding. So if you're looking at the Court of Federal Claims, for example, which deals with a large number of government-related activities in the government contracts area, you will probably find, as uh, we did, for example, in the Ross Himes case, that the judges are incredibly sophisticated and understand with a high degree of intuitiveness exactly what is needed. And so as um, as Harvey mentioned about the ripeness in tomatoes, I did want to make one observation before I talk about some of the other solutions. Mm -hmm. This particular problem has literally probably been around since 1982. There were a number of studies that were published by the old Bureau of Export Administration regarding how joint ventures are established, companies are coming in and taking technologies from nascent industries. There was a focus on China. In addition, Congress had the Office of Technology Assessment. It used to be their arm right. to advise them on different agency, uh, different activities. Now the Congressional Research Service tries to do some of it, but there's actually an interest in bringing the OTA back. The issue was raised in a report in 1983 and 1987, and then the Bureau of Export Administration raised it again in 1999, as did the National Critical Technologies Council in 1995. So, Knowledge was there, ripeness was not. But in those areas, there were select cases, for example, the Melvin case in 1988, which was an old Court of King Claims case, which is a predicate precursor, excuse me, to the US Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. The judges understood that when you have technology that is export controlled or sensitive for national security purposes, you needed to put it under a protective order. And that brings me to mm -hmm. some of the solutions. So apart from education, which I think everyone 
I mean, I'm educated every day by everyone. The situation is so complicated. But I think establishing an um, education program for whether we begin with the bankruptcy courts or extend it more yes. broadly through the administrative office of the courts or some other system, providing a resource database that allows them to have one or two pagers that help them identify the issues. Because unless you have judicial clerks who are particularly attuned to these areas or understand or the judges themselves have an interest, it's incredibly challenging. So some form of educational material. And then secondly, some refinements perhaps in the protective order process and in the in-camera review process. Because those are areas where it's difficult to address this problem of data exposure once it has happened. So if you're in an open court and you're looking at an intellectual property case, a breach of contract case, a fraud case, a warranty case, if someone holds up a drawing to try to explain, for example, some piece of IP, and in the corner it says subject to the ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, it's your first clue, it should not be an open court. <laughs> okay? And that actually happened in a case in California wow. where much to the chagrin of the judge, and this was a challenge because neither of the counsel bringing the case had identified it, and yet when they blew it up, you could see right in the quarter this enormous legend about this being ITAR controlled. Wow. So needless to say, there were some sidebar conversations after that was brought to the judge's attention. But yeah. it's okay if you black it out and tweet it out. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> then, it's, then it's good. It's redaction, yeah, right? It's redaction. That's all right, right. right. Uh, but, but just, the, just take yeah. out the warning. Take that, that's right. right. And it is a, it's a downstream matter. So the courts can have a protective order. But the second layer there is counsel need to understand that if there's a protective order, they can't go and retain for example, experts who are non-U.S. persons. Because sharing technical oh, information that's export yeah. controlled, even if it's under a protective order, does not address the licensing requirements that they have individually mm -hmm. to make sure they don't share the information with foreign counsel, with foreign trade experts, or other experts that they need. So some ensuring and some specificity in the protective order about the downstream impact mm -hmm. might also be helpful. That's great. Um, Camille, in your, in your paper, which again is great, and there's a copy out there, <laughs> so, um, you wrote about uh, how FIRMA um, is empowering judges to be more proactive. Um, talk a little bit about that and how that implementation is going and maybe where it can be pushed a little more. Yeah, so there are some real opportunities in the firmer regulation that was released under the NDAA last year. Um, the, the, the legislation enumerates transactions that occur pursuant to bankruptcy proceedings and other forms of de default or debt um, as something covered by CFIUS, which is an awesome opportunity, and they then charge CFIUS to then create regulations around that. The first set of pilot regulations were released in November and unfortunately did not touch on these bankruptcy or default on debt proceedings. That said though, they have enumerated 27 NAICS codes which are North American Industry Classification, classification system, system Codes, thank you, that kind of align a technology to an industry. And they've pulled out 27 that usually align with national security implications. This is a great flag for judges. One of the questions we get first when we talk to them about this issue is, how am I to identify a national security related technology? And that's a fair question. And so these 27 codes that were enumerated are an opportunity for judges to literally match these codes with the ones that are often included on bankruptcy filings and say, there's a, there, maybe there is a there there and we should ask for proof of a CFIUS review. So that's the first opportunity that comes to light in, um, in the pilot regulations and in FIRMA. Also, there are, um, blanking for a second. There's an opportunity for, um, oh my goodness. <laughs> too young for that. I know. <laughs> um, okay, I'm sorry. So in the FAQs, judges have need the clarification on how they then make this ask as well as how they manage their docket, right? So one of the biggest questions also is, if I ask for this, how long is it gonna take for this person to come back in front of me? How do I manage my docket? 
There is a short form debt filing, or short form filing, excuse me, that can be called out so that debt court proceedings, bankruptcy proceedings can be filed in alignment with the short form filing. So that short form filing has about a 45 day cycle, which is a great opportunity for judges to understand when this person will return to them. They can say 50 days, return to me with proof of a CFIUS review and we can go from there. So there are two opportunities that while the, the, um, the, the procedures as written do not actually talk about bankruptcy and debt court proceedings, they've carved out these awesome opportunities to clarify for judges, clarify for the community ways in which we can understand this problem a little bit better. And so we've actually been talking to Treasury and they're very receptive to adding these carve outs, whether to this set of um, procedures or to the next set and the next pilot. And so it's been a great discussion to see you know, the evolution of this, right? They wanted to put their hands around a, a, a small chunk of the problem and really understand that when they open the aperture on what things could be filed under CFIUS, what they would get, and did not intend to address bankruptcy in this set of pilot regulations, but the way in which they've written it really is right for this kind of a discussion, and they're open to that. Yeah, that could I make, because you made an excellent point about the NAX codes. So they are tied to national security, but what I think you're going to find interesting when you look at the 27 codes, it includes nanotechnology, biotechnology research, ball bearing. Okay, yes, you do find tanks and missiles, you do find semiconductor and semiconductor equipment manufacturing, but I think one of the issues, again, for the courts to, to focus on is, it is not a very narrow definition of national security. It has now become incredibly broad. It is a counterintelligence activity. And so in order to intuit where these issues could arise, it's important that these items be understood as not just a very narrow silo. So, so oh, yeah. So I just, I just want to say that what's fascinating is we never would have had the National Security Division here 10 years ago. As a matter of fact, I'm so old that we had, didn't even have a national security <laughs> when I was with the department. So it's actually want to commend the department because it's an understanding that these issues are rising to a national security emphasis and significance. We have the task force being set up at DOD that's looking at critical sort of infrastructure. We have what's going on um, with the bankruptcy courts. But we don't have a real quarterback, one center point. But I think the NSD could play that potential role and it help to educate also. We have the Federal Judicial Center. We have the Administrative Office of Federal Courts. Mm -hmm. You guys play a big role in helping to educate. I know the bankruptcy judges want to do this. Professor Tab and the, my, the, the gentleman who's my new pen pal, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Robert Barnes. Um, so I think it's interesting that this is rising because it's, it's always a great thing when you show up and it's always a bad thing because <laughs> it means that serious people in the national security <laughs> enterprise are saying, hey, we've got to think about this. It's a good so that's day. what I just want. This is what's commendable and I want to thank you guys for yes. being here. But we need to think through the, that process both with guys like Baker in the private sector who understand what's going on with their clients and those issues and the bar and think people at the intelligence agencies. This is a great moment for us to start thinking through to develop a plan to identify what we want to see what the enemy is doing. And, I, you know, well, let me, let me just uh, get Jamil into the conversation here. In this terms has never of, happened before. I know. <laughs> it will never happen again. So and it's so delightful, like isn't it? It's been, I thought delightful. No, seriously. Yes. It yeah. has never happened before. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, but, but how, I mean, how do we equip judges yeah. to become more national security experts? It's, you know, it's kind of outside their brief, yeah. so to speak, but now they are in some ways, again, like so many other places, on the front lines. Yeah. So talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that you're involved in, some of the things that we want to go down the path with. Yeah, I know this is a softball. This is, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's great. Thank you for asking the question. Um, you know, we, um, 
we partnered with, uh, with TSIL um, and with the Law and Economics Center at uh, George Mason University's Law School uh, to, uh, to put together a proposal to one of our, one of our funders who's just generously agreed to, agreed to give us some money uh, to actually educate bankruptcy judges um, and to kick off a pilot program uh, with Camille, with the team at TSIL, uh, to educate um, uh, judges in this area, specifically to talk about uh, what the opportunities are, what they can do with their existing tools, uh, and what new tools they might advocate for within the AO, um, within uh, to Congress, and talk about what tools they need um, and what tools they can use today, um, including uh, the protective orders they have the capability to issue today, uh, partnering with their district court judges um, to recommend things up and push things up to the district court where they need to, mm -hmm. uh, to, inter to engage with the Justice Department uh, when appropriate, uh, to highlight things or to ask for CFIUS review or to at least recommend to the parties that they come back and go to the Justice Department and say, we, we think we have something that needs, needs review. Um, so the bank shares have a lot of authority in this space uh, in terms of their control of the debtor, um, and they have a lot of room to run. And now it's a matter of saying to them, look, this is a thing that you should care about, which, as Harvey has pointed out and his pen pals have indicated, is something, something they do care about. <laughs> Uh, we had a similar experience. I, I was with a few bankruptcy judges at a law and economics uh, center conference uh, down in Florida, and, and they were deeply interested in these issues um, and were excited to hear that there was an opportunity to, hear, to learn more about it and learn what their tools are. Um, so I think there's an opportunity here that we've got now with this, uh, with this donor um, who's willing to help us support this kind of an effort. And so we'll be out there. We'll be talking to bankruptcy judges around the country. Uh, we'll be educating some discord judges. I think we'll focus in the first instance on the Northeast Corridor, Delaware, New York. Um, um, and then if it works and people find it of interest, we'll expand it nationwide and um, expand the aperture. This is part of a larger effort uh, that we've got ongoing to educate judges in a variety of fields of law, uh, but in particular for NSI and for TSIL uh, and for our partners, uh, an opportunity to educate judges in the national security and cyber arenas. I'm um, going to really get them up to speed and give them the tools they need uh, to effectively identify issues in their courtroom, uh, think about how to use, utilize the tools they have, whether it's SEPA or other capabilities, um, and, and really address some of these threats and, and, and lean forward, um, even though they have, a, they have a narrow role to play, it's an important role, um, and one that we think the judges can, um, in doing their day-to-day -day jobs, uh, really help effectuate the national security. Just for the yeah. viewers, SEPA uh, is the Classified Information Protection Act. Thank you, sir, yes. Yeah. yes. Thank you. For people, uh, yeah. Harvey, um, and, and then Camille, before we kind of turn it open, open into questions, were there other, you know, uh, possible solutions that you had mentioned some so, before, but other things that I, I, just I think, think you yeah. wanted to jump in, Camille? Just think of the aperture. So, you know, you said that the judges, this is new. We have one of the legendary judges from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court sitting in the audience. There's been a whole history under the FISA and FISA court of the development of judges who have been extremely skilled in understanding what the threat matrix is coming at the United States. We carved it out as a separate court, as a separate understanding of Article III judges. Bankruptcy has always been a separate entity unto itself, which is always intriguing as Article I judges. But there's, I think, an opportunity for there to be an understanding of un what the threat is. And it's not the traditional threat that um, we've historically understood mm -hmm. of Title 50 spy versus spy surveillance. This is a whole new that many of us have been trying to ring the bell for a long time, as you said, since the 80s. But I think there's a huge opportunity for them to understand how our, the networks are being created. And I think there's also a role for the National Intelligence Council and the idea of an NIE, a National Intelligence Estimate, I think would be very helpful if we went forward to have that and it could be classified to get a greater okay. sense of, and you, where you sit it would also be helpful at the PAB to help generate that so that we start getting a much better map mm. of what is going on with critical adversaries and that that is then passed out to the judges in a way that gets them to understand and then we reform the forms in, bank, in bankruptcy, but also think about what we're going to do with the FISA court in order to help expand that power that will be able to us to get a much better vector into when we understand what the, what the, and then make it public like this so people realize, you know, we say there's two approaches. Either you want to um, hug the panda or you want to slay the dragon. Are you a dragon slayer or a panda hugger? Well, I think mm -hmm. what we really need to have are panda trainers and we need dragon trainers because we have to get this these major adversaries back mm -hmm. on a sort of keel for us to go forward because mm -hmm. if we don't get it right 
my advice always for free is I encourage you to have your children learn Mandarin, which is what I'm doing with my grandchildren. If I could make an observation, just two seconds. Uh, the Department of Defense publishes targeting U.S. technologies mm -hmm. every year, and they have done it for a long time. It has never included access to court proceedings as a way for targeting U.S. So technologies. I would say that we used to have the economic espionage yes. report that the last right. one came out in 2011. Right. The current, that administration was not happy with the outcome. Right. And now the only entity that looks at it is usually coming out of, the, it used to be called the DSS, right, the Defense Security right. Service. It's now the Defense Counterintelligence right. Security Agency. Right. They publish a very famous report that took over from the report that NCIX made, but it's sort of sad that's where it's gotten yeah. pushed to. And it's sort of sad when you said it's coming out of the NDAA. These are coming all out of the department's, defense department's power as opposed to right. Right, other well, elements of the state. Right, I mean, the Defense Production Act allows you, for a fair amount. But it, I think yes. that the question that I just wanted two yeah. seconds before Camille was that there are tools that are publicly available. These reports are incredibly insightful and helpful. And even adding a small segment that says, look at it holistically. The government's looking at this as the whole of government. We need to look at it as the whole of society, right. as you said, and the whole of industry, and including that kind of information about the access to our court system mm -hmm. and the bankruptcy courts in particular would be very educational across the board. I agree. Hey, right. Camille, quickly before we yeah, turn to Yeah, I just wanted to take a, a moment to illustrate Giovanna's point on the, the complexity of identifying these national security-related technologies, as well as to highlight the importance of technology to support I'm judges in this that. endeavor, because that. It is so complex. So um, recently, like Grinder was sold to a Chinese company, and that was rolled back about two years after that sale was made. Grinder is a dating app. So that capability would not on its face seem like a national security related sale, but the kind of information that can be collected and when you know aggregated with the other information that is available about people, Ex wow. <laughs> can yeah. social engineer you know, yeah. a great multitude of things and is a behavioral targeting mechanism that is just an, a really advanced capability, right, that on its face no one would have ever, um, particularly without some kind of training and support, been able to identify as something with national security implications. So beyond also training judges, because to, to your point, the 27 NAICS codes are out of date in terms of like being forward leaning on emerging capabilities and things like that. Um, we need to figure out a technology solution that can take a look across economic development, innovation, and help flag these things for judges. And can scale. And can scale. Yeah. Right. So on that point, before I turn to Q&A, um, uh, we at TESOL, as we said, we like to build and pilot uh, solutions. And part of those solutions are not just in the education and, and um, helping to educate lawmakers, but in the technological side as well. So um, we are partnering um, with this outfit out of uh, California Kaggle that runs contests. Um, for different types of algorithms. We've given them um, a, a database to work from. What we want to achieve is exactly, as Camille saying, a prototype of if this is the information, the data that's that's already in the database of sensitive technologies, of things that are, you know, uh, have ITAR or EAR, um, that when a bankruptcy proceeding comes on a docket, it can be matched to a database of these are existing sensitive technologies, and it can flash for the judge, green light, fine, go ahead, yellow, pause, red, send it immediately for CFIUS for review. Because one thing we realize, and you know, when I talk to big companies about cybersecurity, companies that have are, are just manufacturing something, don't are not cybersecurity companies. You know, they always look at me and they're like, but we're not cybersecurity experts. Do we have to now become cybersecurity experts? I'd say the same thing with, you know, with the judges. Do they now need to be able to keep all of that in their head, you know, the 27 NAX codes? No, of course not. We need, in part and parcel to the education, we need a some kind of technology that can help match this with selectors to be able to give them the ability um, then to say, oh, I better call the guy at Treasury, take a look at this. 
Um, so we are here at the lab. We're piloting um, a, a scalable version and then giving it to the government or whatever to then take it take it to scale. Okay. With that, we have uh, I don't know something like uh, 20 minutes for Q and A. Um, so there are um, mics. Uh, please wait for the mic and uh, don't forget to introduce yourself. Okay. Hey, thanks for your work on this. Um, the ATOP Tech bankruptcies and the Molly Corp bankruptcies happened before FIRMA. Um, and bankruptcy judges don't have the authority to tell any buyer of any asset that they don't have to go through any sort of regulatory process, whether they're buying a hospital or something with licenses. Um, does FIRMA extinguish any concern about this because of the era that we're in with mandatory declarations? So FIRMA does not itself take any action. That's going to be left for the regulations to dictate whether it extends. And FIRMA right now is drafted to apply primarily to the CFIUS process itself. So there is not a direct solution that is facing, uh, that, that we can derive directly from FIRMA. And interestingly, although FIRMA included expressly certain types of debt and bankruptcy proceedings as a covered transaction, for CFIUS actually believed it had that jurisdiction prior to FIRMA. And there were a number of cases, as you mentioned, ATOP and Molly Corp both preceded FIRMA. I think the other issue, though, and it is a legislative impediment, there's a lot of laws and regulations out there that unfortunately silo the way systems, the U.S. government can use information. So information collected in one context within the government is not automatically shareable, either amongst agencies amongst branches of governments or even within the same agency. And so there would have to be some additional refinement. Now, to Camille's point, and I'd love to hear your view, I think the regulations may address some of that that would give the bankruptcy judges some additional leverage to say, perhaps as a matter of closing this transaction, please present us with these authorizations and approvals because that is an appropriate transfer of the asset. And um, in certain laws, just I, I can't believe I'm going to say this in public, but um, you know the judges could be personally liable if they permit violations to occur. And uh, I can't imagine any attorney would ever say that to a judge in court. So, but but fundamentally, if an executive branch agency wanted to make the point in in a proceeding, they could. You know, raise that with the judge. It's never been a career-enhancing move on the lawyer's no. part. No, no. no. In my experience. Ergo, too. why I don't Suja litigate. Just right. For the no, attorneys no. in the room. No, you turn them in. You call the department. Right. Yeah. Do, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I'm Doug Wood, and I'm a TESOL advisor. And uh, one of the uh, things I've noted in the past is uh, a slightly different area of law, but contract dispute is another area where I, foreigners might uh, dispute the award of a contract and tie up the uh, work in court. And it's not because they want the work, they're just trying to tie it up. Yes, as That's you know, a lot of lawyers in town have done extremely well under DFARS yeah. mm -hmm. and litigating those issues. A lot of homes in Palm Beach have paid, uh, and um, I mean, there's not a contract that is awarded by the DOD that it goes on. That and goes I on think legally. that DFAR reform for contract awarding, I think a lot of us would think would be a very good thing. But there are a lot of forces that have derived a great deal of living doing the doing the con the contests. Hi, my name is Danielle Hernandez, and I'm a legal fellow at the Department of Defense. So um, I heard you say that it's not necess necessarily necessary for judges or attorneys to understand the technology. Um, do all of you feel that way, that um, it's not necessary that attorneys actually understand um, the technology? Well, I, I want to say it's not that it's not necessary, it's just, you know, there, there's so much you have to do in any given day to also Certainly. be an expert yes. on quantum um, yes. or to know that this is the way, you know, we had talked about it before that some of these filings, you won't, uh, unless you really read through it and mm -hmm. understand it, you, it won't pop out. It won't be that the top category is quantum. Right. So I think yeah, you have so. to sort of disaggregate the concept, right? Because if you go to the Northern District 
in California, th that bench has gotten an extraordinary number of cases tied to technology. We also have a cohort issue, which is uh, the, as the younger people get on the bench, they're more attuned as to what technology has been and whether they've lived with it. Third, I think the FJC, the Federal Judicial Center, and the AO are doing a number of courses to help assist judges understand the underlying technology. It's something Aspen Institute has, used to do for years and has continued to do it. I think the, the, I think the, the, the bench has recognized the desire, but when you get to the high court, it's only recently that we have had a number, if you look at the law clerks and where they've gone, you will see many of them have gone into the leading university technological groups vis-a-vis uh, -vis their time with the justices on these issues. So I think there's been a, a, a clear transformation going on, but I would say all, all the judges I know are very intrigued and interested in wanting to understand this in a more full way and get a more neutral understanding of what the technology is. And increasingly, more and more cases, as you know, are filling the dockets on this technological issue. Many people in the Valley are not happy with the way many of the cases are being unfolded. And one of them is this issue about how we understand antitrust law, how we understand the issue who we're competing with. Mm. And that's becoming a many, uh, I've been in a number of groups who are interested in trying to help the judiciary and the legislature understand what may be required for us to be competitive going in the 21st century, because many of our adversaries do not have the same antitrust problems that we're confronting. Well, we're also, so I, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, we're, also, we're also sort of creating antitrust problems where none exist, right? Where we're going after companies because they're too, they've succeeded too, too effectively rather than engaged in potentially anti-competitive behavior. Uh, but, but to your question, I think, about the question, about the question whether lawyers or, or judges need to understand technology, absolutely they do. I don't think that's what, what Samantha was saying. Yeah. I, think that, I think Samantha's point was it's, you need to give them capabilities that allow them to ingest the information that's out there uh, a lot faster and in a lot more capable way, right? You can't expect them to be able to dig through the filings, identify the potential threats, and figure it out on their own. If we can build a capability, a technological capability, combined with the education we can provide mm -hmm. them, then they can have both a capability and, and a knowledge base. But, but to your question about technology, we're spending a lot of time um, at NSI in partnership with people like TSL, the ABA, and the like, um, and with, with you know, the support of our donors to go out and educate lawyers on technology. Uh, we, we, held a, we held our first, actually, uh, tech lawyer boot camp um, to teach lawyers about technology, basically starting with how does my iPhone work, mm. right, <clears throat> to sort of beginning the conversation about a quantum encryption um, at Steptoe just this past, uh, this past summer. Uh, we'll be educating a cohort of federal government lawyers here in the next, in the next uh, year. We'll be rolling out a similar program for judges. Um, the, the bankruptcy effort is one aspect of the start of that effort, but we'll be doing a larger cyber intelligence and national security law training for judges uh, with the Law and Economics Center at George Mason. So you're absolutely right, it's a critical issue. Nobody's saying lawyers judges don't need to understand technology better. And the flip side is, for our legislators and our policymakers, they need more technologists informing them. So under a grant from the Hewlett Foundation, we're actually, we've selected a group of 25 technologists, data scientists, coders around the country, where we're actually taking them and teaching them how to talk policy, right? How to talk to policymakers. They'll be here next weekend uh, being trained on how to develop policy proposals and how to put them in the hands of uh, legislators um, and, and executive branch policymakers. So we're doing both sides of it. Train the lawyers how to talk technology, the judges how to understand technology, and, and the technologists how to talk to policymakers. And we should underscore the so, Hewlett Foundation has been extraordinary. Yes. The yeah. Hewlett Foundation is an extraordinary mm -hmm. and e a number of people, yeah. Eli Sugarman, yeah. that have yeah. helped spearhead so, this absolutely. and have funded this and, and should be commended for doing this. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to raise, because I have a, a slightly different perspective. I understand what, what Hardy and Jamil have said. Uh, I think that when you look at the courts, there's an obligation to be able to identify issues. You don't have to have a PhD in quantum physics to be able to understand what happened to Schrodinger's cat. I'm probably mispronouncing <laughs> that name, okay. But the point is that the level <laughs> of education. Well, what's unclear, yeah, I mean, not it's not as easy. It's unclear about what happened. It's not unclear. Like right. Okay, so, um, and outside counsel or counsel in companies have obligations under their ethics requirements to be members of the bar that they have to have sufficient understanding of technology, not just how to search 
for terms and papers and things. But technology itself, as they bring cases, because under Rule 11, you're required when you submit complaints and other documentation, you must be able to certify basically to their accuracy. You cannot do that if you don't have sufficient access to resources that allow you to identify the issues and speak cogently and competently on them. Now, so from an issue identification perspective, I think it would be incredibly helpful to arm judges and counsel with more of what Camille and others were talking about. What are the key pressure points? What are the choke points? What are the initial inquiries you need to make? And from there, that's why judges get to ask the parties to brief them. Uh, there should be an obligation. If the judge needs to understand some aspect of quantum physics, then the parties have an obligation to explain that to the judge in terms that are understandable and relatable to the matters before the court. Thank you very much for uh, coming today, and this is very interesting. Uh, we addressed. Okay, uh, uh, say who you are. Introduce sorry. yourself. My name is Benjamin Weil. Uh, we addressed um, the bankruptcy of U.S. companies. However, um, I think the threat might go extend a little further where it's not the U.S. Uh, company that goes bankrupt, but its mother company, if it's a subsidiary of a company outside of the U.S. Let's say Russia and China right now are giving many loans to defaulting countries, Venezuela and African countries and many others around the world, where then the um, that company in the U.S. is held accountable against this loan that they can't mm -hmm. give back. And then yeah. it's a backdoor yeah. that bypasses the law mm -hmm. system here. Sure. My question is how we can deal with that in courts here in the U.S. Interesting question. Uh, well, my sense is, you know, we're seeing a very clever strategy that the Chinese are using for lending their funds around the world. And when there's default judgments in those countries, there's a reaction as to what the Chinese then ex extract in order for them to have the loan made good. That's a separate international bankruptcy set of issues. But I think <coughs> how you educate the countries to understand going and receiving that type of funding and what the possible consequences are. And when we talked about what is in those contracts, do they fully <coughs> grasp what the consequences are for the remedies in the contracts in those countries is an international sort of educational phenomena that I think increasingly some high profile cases that you alluded to, people are starting to look much more closely on what those lending documents look like. Yeah, and, I, and I, I would just add that, you know, just as in the years after 9-11, a whole discipline of terrorist financing sure. um, kind of grew up um, we really are <laughs> behind the eight ball on creating a like discipline of, I don't even know, international financial uh, uh, intelligence and, and analytics because um, this is really where we're going to have to understand how our economy and our wherewithal is, is being put in the crosshairs. And um, your point, we're not alone. The United States cannot do this alone. Right. Yeah. Or Rose, um, I guess I go back a few years. Uh, I started practicing before the CAFC was established. And back then, um, the CAFC was one of the few courts that was recognized as having, uh, at least the judges, having some expertise with uh, science and technology. Mm. Now, I don't know whether it's changed very much since then. That was primarily because they handled a fair number of patent cases. Right. Right. But it's interesting because the predicate, the precursor to the court of uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal court Circuit and the Court of Right was the Court of Claims, yeah. and you had judges that handled, let's say, customs and international trade cases that may or may not have the had the expertise. But for example, Judge Rich, who was yeah. one of the original drafters of right. the 1952 patent law was on the court and had an encyclopedic knowledge of technology and issues. And he used to bring clerks that had similar background uh, to it. And, you know, uh, an alternative solution is perhaps the court could have 
two or three clerks that are technologically mm. sophisticated, well, that are shared amongst the judges. Well, we have special masters that the courts can always yeah. establish, the special but I think right. part right. of the issue is we've the way the federal system has evolved, different jurisdictions get to become, because of the rate and volume of the cases, they start to become much more expertise on issues. Right now, the D.C. Court of Appeals and D.C. Court trial judges are probably the leading authorities on terrorism issues related to Guantanamo and related to... You don't know anything about that. No, I, I, I would say that whether one agrees or disagrees with the judge's opinions, they have an expertise that they've evolved because of the cases. We, we all know if you, if you have an SEC problem, you're going to go to New York. Mm -hmm. If you're a plaintiff you know, case, you're going to Texas. Texas. So okay, but everyone is, yeah. but you know what I mean? So we've evolved. And then the question is, as you're saying, what is the appetite for the federal judiciary to start to have a level of expertise among the bench? Mm -hmm. We've always, we've created it for tax courts. We've created it for certain highly technical areas. And it's an interesting question you're posing. Is there a point in time now that we should think in the federal judiciary, given what's happening with this level of technology, of carving out a space mm -hmm. for a special jurisdiction, which we've done mm -hmm. for bankruptcy, for instance, which yeah. we've done for labor? Right. Is this a time that we should have a public debate about it? And uh, I think yeah. one of the other things to consider is, because I agree with you, Harvey, there are courts simply by the nature of the number of cases mm -hmm. that are brought. You mentioned, I think, California, the, the different district courts and the the Ninth Circuit that have an enormous number of software cases. But I, I would make an observation, for example, from the protective order side, the Ninth Circuit and the district courts in California are weak on protective orders related to export controls. They really, the language they have embedded mm. in their standard protective orders that, is, that are used in every matter mm. uh, are not adequate to inform parties of their obligations. They're conclusory in nature and they candidly don't assist the courts in understanding where the different pressure points exist. So they've got years and years of experience. So, but the effectiveness. So Camille, yes. your next law review has just been put forward <laughs> about <laughs> what the model should be for the protective orders. How perfect. We look forward to reading your next <laughs> educational scholarship. Actually, we are say, working we're already on that. We are working on that. I am yes. shocked. Okay. Shock. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, another another question. I think we have time for one more. Um, uh, so if not, I'm, I'm going to see whether the, the panel has some uh, kind of concluding comments that they would like to make. Uh, you started, Camille. Camille? Go this ahead. is all yours. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. You started and then um, we'll finish. Yeah, so I think we are in a good moment to, to make some, some progress on this. It is very clear by the expertise on this panel that there are smart people looking at the issue. We just need some mobilization of folks to take a look and to really put some money behind a lot of this. Um, we've been having some interesting conversations on the Hill and like I said with Treasury mm -hmm. that really has shown promise for progress in this area. Um, but to the gentleman's point earlier, there is a lot of work to be done across the court system to make sure that our judges are equipped on these issues and have an understanding that rises to the level and is, and is able to adapt and evolve with the changing times and the changing capabilities. So there's a lot of work to be done here. The, the so I think, uh, oh, thing, yeah, go ahead. I, was, I think what... Um, I think the issue is ripe now. The tomatoes have arrived, uh, as uh, to use uh, Harvey's analogy. And I think in part it's been driven by the extensive concern regarding the pervasiveness of this issue. Many years ago, this was viewed candidly as a Department of Defense problem. It is now everyone's problem the court system, every government agency, every company, because no one has no data. No one has no access to cyber and technology because it's just a matter of course to protect the information you have. And no one tends to work insularly in the United States. Everyone is global in some fashion. So I think we have a perfect storm, a confluence of circumstances now where the issue is ready to be addressed. And my only, my only uh, hesitation is sometimes these types of time periods and inflection points push the responses to the extreme that then need to come back. But I think we have a clear mm -hmm. opportunity, not only in the research that Camille has laid out eloquently in her article, but the work that's being looked at, to bring a measured response that is both effective 
and able to withstand the long term. I, I would concur. You know, when I was the dean of the National War College, we always said that you, uh, you look through our, our arc of history, there are certain core inflection points. And I think many of us agree we're at an inflection point now. And I think if we dither and we let this moment go without going forward in a manner that we will, our grandchildren will look back to us and say, oh, they were the group yes. that figured out how to lose the special thing that, and precious thing we have. So reinforcing what you're saying, I think there's a consensus among certain groups, and we at the ABA, you at FTD, you, you, you at the SCLIA thing, the private sector, it's very, very critical that we work with our extraordinary power at DOJ to coordinate this in a manner that we can be proud of. So I would say, why don't we come back in two years and see whether or not we've been successful in doing this as a criteria that we could all gather and see how what kind of score we give ourselves. That's great. Penultimate word. Look, I mean, that I, I think second to last, but really. For, <laughs> but, but for but for uh, you know Camille's work and the work that TESOL has done on this issue, we wouldn't even know about this issue. Yeah. And so, thank you for that work. Uh, thank you for partnering with us. And. Um, like Harvey said, we'll be back in two years and see yeah. how we did. Yeah. Well, again, let me thank everyone for, for coming out for this critical issue. And, and you know, I've, I've told a number of people, um, this truly is, you know, in, in my career, as long as it has been, maybe the first time where when we pose an issue, no one has said, oh, this isn't an issue. Don't worry about it. Right? We didn't get any pushback on that. And when we didn't get any pushback of, don't worry, we've got it under control. Right? The typical response when you go to different agencies in the government, ah, don't worry about it. We, we're doing it. If you only knew, you know, we were doing it. No one said that. Um, so you know, we're really proud to have identified this and, and trying to close close the gaps. But again, thank you so much. Thank stay you. stay in touch. Stay in tune. Um, and uh, uh, keep in touch for what else uh, we're, we're we're working on. So thank you. Thank you.